financial swindler and his mistress. All the investors really did was provide millions to keep Leo Caret's girlfriends in style. It was Leo Caret's involvement with women that caused him to become involved with high finance. And it was his involvement with high finance that caused him to commit suicide in a Chicago jail cell by stuffing his diabetic system with sugar. The rise and fall of Leo Caretz began when, after winning some success as a broker, he decided it would be nice to have a beautiful mistress in an expensive apartment of his very own. But soon Caretz found one mistress was not enough, so he acquired another and set her up in a luxury apartment. Later he took another, then another, until he almost lost track of his beautiful possessions. These diversions cost money, and the profits from the brokerage business were far from adequate. The problem was solved when he dreamed up a non-existent timber and oil bonanza and persuaded gullible investors to buy five million worth of its valueless stock. In the end, his castle of straw collapsed. He lost his money, then his mistresses, and then his freedom, and finally his life. Born in 1880, Leo Caretz was a moderately successful Chicago broker when in 1916 he found the recent acquisition of several mistresses required an increased income. His plans to use the public's money to keep his girlfriends together got underway when he casually mentioned to a few friends that he had bought five million acres of timberland on the Bayano River in Panama. Soon afterwards he travelled to New York where he hinted around finance circles that he was on his way to inspect his Panama holdings an investment that might pay unheard of dividends. Caretz then disappeared for several weeks. When he did return to Chicago, he bought a huge mansion on Lake Michigan, put a yellow Rolls Royce in one of the garages, and generally began throwing money around like water. At first he was reluctant to talk about his newly acquired wealth, but when he finally relented he admitted his Panama holdings were thick with mahogany a valuable timber that was now being cut and shipped by hundreds of native employees. Begging his friends to keep this information secret, the broker then showed them a telegram purporting to come from his Panama manager. It stated that production was limited only by labour availability and added that the capital investment should give a 10 to 1 return. For a time, Caretz refused his friends' appeals to let them in on the deal saying he was afraid his pig-headedness might break the friendships he valued. When his friends had invested sums of $10,000 to $50,000, others began badgering him for a chance to get in on the bonanza. Deciding at last to open the share issue to the public, Caretz and a huge staff began accepting investments until by mid-1918 he had collected about $500,000, much of which went on the establishment of a chain of apartments each equipped with a mistress. In Chicago, his two chief women friends were a former florist who lived in luxury on Drexel Boulevard and a burlesque queen who wallowed in an easy living on the south side. At Hot Springs in Arkansas, where Caretz regularly retreated to forget his business worries, a beautiful manicurist who had temporarily retired from the occupation constantly awaited her lover's coming. Chief of his New York harem was a former nightclub girl who lived in an apartment usually reserved for those in the millionaire class. The demands made by these paramours on Caret's income was enormous. Thus, towards the end of 1918, the financier decided it was urgently necessary to increase the flow of cash into his dozens of bank accounts. Caret's showed them another telegram from the manager of the Bayano Timber Syndicate. It read, Four more gushes struck predict 400,000 barrels daily minimum. Please, urgently need equipment. Within 24 hours, the news was all over Chicago. But again, Caretz was reluctant to let other investors in on the strike. All he did was announce he was going to New York to buy the urgently needed equipment. Instead of going to New York, he went to Colorado Springs, where he spent a fortnight with the mistress who had been set up in the resort months before. Immediately on his return to Chicago, Caretz announced he would accept limited investments in the oil bonanza. The first week he took $180,000, then week after week about the same sum came in. To show their appreciation of his generosity, shareholders entertained the millionaire to dinner at the exclusive Drake Hotel. Caretz blushed appropriately as laudatory phrases rolled off the tongues of a succession of speakers. But the day came when the inflow of capital waned. 
This time, Caretz solved the problem by inviting wealthy investors to join him on a Lake Michigan yacht cruise. When the yacht was well offshore, a speedboat pulled alongside and the driver handed Caretz an urgent telegram. The tycoon showed it to his guests. It was from the mighty Standard Oil Company and offered to buy Caretz oil interests for $25 million. When all had read the message, Caretz announced he had no intention of selling. If it was worth that much to Standard Oil, it was worth more to him, he said. The result was another flood of investors' money, and if the success of his enterprises delighted Caretz, his investors were equally pleased. When he was in timber only, investors were paid dividends of 10% a year, but with the oil strike, the rate rose to 5% a quarter and then to 5% a month. In 1923, the inevitable happened. A group of investors who were heavily committed said they would like to make a tour of inspection of the Bayano holdings. Caretz expressed delight at the investors' interest and announced that in October he personally would lead the inspection party on its tour. With the coming of October also came Caret's serious attack of diabetes, a complaint from which he was known to suffer. With December approaching, the inspection party members were becoming impatient. Caret's knew it and agreed to send a delegation of six investors to two of the Bayano Enterprises. He regretted his health would not allow him to go with them. But before the delegation went south, Caret's took it east, to New York, where he wined and dined it lavishly. At one exotic dinner in a palatial New York hotel, Caretz had the table decorated with a scale model of an oil field. It was complete down to miniature figures of the workers. This, Caretz told the delegation members, after they had delightedly inspected the model, was an exact replica of the Bayano oil field. Next day, December 1st, 1923, Caretz stood on a New York wharf and waved goodbye as the six investors set sail on the SS Santa Luisa for Panama. When the party came ashore at Balboa, they looked around for the company's manager, Amos Espinosa, who, Caretz had said, would meet them and conduct them on a six-day tour of the holdings. But the manager did not show up and the party, after booking into a local hotel, set off for the Bayano Syndicate headquarters with the intention of chiding the tardy Espinosa. But they could not find Espinosa. Indeed, they could not even find the company's headquarters. Not one of all the people they spoke to during the search had ever heard of Espinosa or the Bayano Oil Syndicate. Then members of the inspection party met C. L. Peck, an American engineer, who knew the Bayano River country well. Taking Peck back to their hotel, the investors showed him their map of the territory and pointed out the red ring around the company's property. Peck looked at the anxious men with sympathy, then pointed out that the territory contained only wild Kuma Indians, snakes, alligators and swamps. When cables began pouring into the offices of government authorities in Chicago from the panic-stricken investors, the city's state attorney, Robert Crow set up a team of investigators to work, probing the ramifications of the Bayano Oil Syndicate. They also tried to investigate Leo Caretz, but neither they nor the police could find him. He had skipped. It did not take long to discover that Caretz's only tangible asset was a string of mistresses. Apart from that, he had no oil, no timber. Amos Espinosa was a myth, and Caretz had not even been in Panama. After that, the investors raided Caret's bank accounts and safe deposit boxes. There was not a cent in the bank accounts, and all the safe deposit boxes were empty. The swindler had taken the lot. But if the state attorney's men could find none of the investors' minions, they did find a stack of love letters in Caret's suite of offices that allowed them to pinpoint the location of the swindler's strategically placed chain of harems. All of the girls were interviewed, but none of them had seen their lover. In fact, they had not even received their usual weekly check. Some months later, when one of the girls remembered that Caretz had once said he would like to live in Halifax, Nova Scotia, after his retirement, detectives sped to the city. Quick inquiries showed that a man of Caretz's description, but under the name of Lou Kite, had arrived there some months earlier, and, after paying 50000 for an out-of-town estate, had deposited 240000 in cash in a bank. About midday, on November 23, 1924, the detectives descended on the Kite estate, only to learn that the new owner was in Halifax on business. 
Driving back to the city, the detectives patrolled the streets until they noticed a yellow Rolls Royce, similar to the one owned by Coretz, parked outside a hotel. Inside the building, the detectives found their quarry, not drinking or conducting business, but passing the time with a woman in an upstairs bedroom. Taken back to Chicago, Coretz was charged with larceny, embezzlement and the operation of a confidence game. Later, before a judge and jury, he pleaded guilty. When he was sentenced to 10 years in Joliet Penitentiary, the wife of one of his victims said, You ought to get the death sentence. Coretz replied, That's exactly what it is, madam. I won't live a year. A month later, Leo Coretz bribed a guard to get him a three-pound box of chocolates. In a few hours, he ate the lot, fully realising that to a diabetic such an intake would be fatal. Soon after he was found lying on the floor of his cell, he died in the prison hospital.